right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today we're going to our lecture today. First, before we get into that, um, you know, what do you think these three men have in common? We may have seen it in my last, in my opening slide there. We're talking about serial killers today. Um, all three of these men, uh, as you'll be learning about, uh, we're all at one point serial killers in different parts of the United States. So here we go. So they all are serial killers. All right, so serial killer, what does that mean? Last week we talked about, uh, in our last lecture, we talked about spree killers and mass murders. Um, again, how they're, they're different. Um, again, a mass murder, you got basically one crime scene, victims are wrong place, wrong time. Um, usually it's a short, um, a shorter of a time period when all this stuff happens, maybe an hour, maybe seconds, could be minutes. Um, spree killers are somebody that kind of hops from place to place. Again, still happens, there's more than one crime scene. Um, multiple deaths um, that happen again in a somewhat short time span could be days could be weeks um, so then we can move on to serial killers so kind of what makes them different compared to the other ones so we have um, a serial killer is somebody's defined who kills three or more people uh, over a period of a month or more so in some cases you might see a month you might see three months you might even see years in some cases um, before they're actually caught, and, and again, it depends. Um, their their list can, um, you know, can range uh, from again three or more. Uh, usually, with serial killers, though, kind of what makes them different compared to other um, types of uh, killers is that usually there's a there's a cooling off time in between killings. Um, specifically, why this this you know cooling off time might last three months or more, or in some cases maybe it might be years. Um, so they commit the act, and there's usually a lull, um, a period where there, nothing typically happens. They're kind of getting off their killing high, so to speak. Um, whereas with spree murders and mass murders, there really is no cooling off time. Um, things happen so quick within, again, days or minutes or even seconds um, in terms of when the act is committed. So you see examples here, Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, John Gacy, you see here. Um, were again once, um, you know, serial killers in the United States that are that are um, that get all the headlines um, for what they've done in the past. All right, so again, what are the differences between a mass murder and a serial killer? So it kind of gives you some different characteristics. Um, by the way, you guys should all be taking this stuff in your guys' guided notes. Um, so if you haven't done that already, this is really the first slide you need uh, for that. Um, but a mass murderer is somebody who kills multiple victims. Well, so does a serial killer, multiple victims. So that, that part they have in common. Um, but a mass murderer, again, as I said before, uh, the, the victims who are killed in these cases are typically wrong place at the wrong time. They're not really targeted, um, so to speak. Um, a mass murderer, their, their, their plan is to go somewhere and kill as many people as they possibly could or can. Uh, whereas a serial killer, they carefully select who their victims are going to be. Um, typically, as you'll learn about in this lecture, there's typically characteristics, whether it's women or it's oh, men, uh, certain age groups, maybe certain hair colors. Um, usually, there's a there's a correlation with that in terms of why they're selected. Um, in a mass murder, there's usually one crime scene, uh, whereas in a serial killer, typically many crime scenes um, from where the killing takes place. Um, mass murder again, there's a single episode, it's one event, whereas in serial killers, there's multiple events. Each you know, at least one per killing. And for mass murder, typically there's no specific methodology or sequence of events that typically happens that's involved, whereas serial killers there typically is. It's very specific. You'll see connections in terms of how the people are being killed. Um, it seems for the most part be pretty consistent, which is how they sometimes make those connections between serial killers. All right, so very important uh, in the criminal world is criminal profiling. Um, as you'll see, as we'll talk about, there's different profiles for these types of murders um, for serial killers. There's patterns um, that you could find. So typically when you're on your suspect list, you could typically cancel people out by looking into careers or social statuses, um, whether they're a family man or not a family man, IQ levels, education levels. Um, there's some different patterns that you can definitely see uh, that, tends to, that typically tends to fit. Uh, for this, but criminal profiling is using law enforcement uh, to help find possible solutions uh, for serial killers. Uh, there, it's a behavioral investigative tool that helps investigators um, 
accurately predict kind of who they're looking for, what age range of a person they're looking for. It could be age, again, it could be uh, IQ level, um, you name it, um, profession, etc. All right, so some assumptions. Um, crime scenes reflect the personality. Um, that's absolutely, most for the most part, true. Um, you know, with these serial killers, there's usually, usually something that's unique about these um, in terms of how they murder. Um, you know, the manner of death could be very consistent. Um, you could typically tell, too, it's, if it's an organized killing or disorganized, too. So we'll get into that here in a minute uh, in terms of the crime scene. Um, the methods of operation remain um, similar. So there's usually clues that are left behind uh, by the serial killer. Um, so here's the Zodiac killer here. We'll leave a little Zodiac puzzle, basically, after each killing. So that's why typically those are connected. It could be the manner in which the person's killed. Uh, it could be very consistent amongst victims. Um, so there's usually a signature behind it. Um, again, the signature will remain the same as, we'll say, consistent um, in terms of which the crime is being committed. The manner, words used, something left at the scene can be consistent as well. And the criminal's personality will not change throughout the process. Um, the core personality cannot change. Usually the person's intelligent, it's charming, good appearance, enjoys terror of the victim. There's no consciousness with these victims. Again, this is consistent for the most part. There are exceptions to that, as we'll talk about. So here's, again, here's a victim list, as you guys see in this, uh, see in this slide. You know, many of the women, for the most part, well, obviously there's one example here in terms of victims. They're all women, right? Um, you see a lot of dark-haired women um, that are on the list. Um, for the most part, you see a lot of, we'll say, older, middle-aged to older women um, as well. I don't really see any particularly young. Um, so, again, these, these are, again, patterns. Um, so here's the victims list you can see. This is when they died. Um, 14th of June 1962. So you see this pattern here from basically beginning in t from June through August through December, March, May. So this is where things kind of get more sporadic here. So there's a huge list here of a lot in June, a lot in August. There's a couple months off. You see December. Um, so usually here you got four, two months off, um, two killings here, a couple months off. Then you see a few more months off here. And then these get, things get more sporadic and more spaced out. Um, but you see the age groups here, 55, 85, 68, 60, 70, 60s, there's 20s, 60s. So you see, for the most part, most of these victims are 50 years old and up. There are obviously some, some exceptions to that. So again, you're seeing patterns here. All right, so subjects. Obviously, they're all female here. Age and race is not necessarily too consistent. But again, as we said, most of the females are above the age of 50. Um, other thing was kind of interesting too, they, all of these women were murdered in their own apartments. So what does that tell you too? Um, obviously there was no forced entry. So there's no forced entry that tells you that the women probably knew who the murderer was, uh, whether he maybe posed as, um, as something as a, uh, maybe, um, an electrician or he, uh, posed as a utility worker or flat out he, he knew the victims or he befriended them somehow. But somehow they, they may have earned some kind of trust for them to let them in. Uh, all of these victims were also raped. Um, bodies were left in obscene positions. Um, that's also kind of a trademark of uh, serial killers as well. All of them were strangled um, with their silk stockings, um, tied stockings and a bow underneath their chin. And this guy will terrorize Boston for about 18 months. He's also known as the Boston Strangler. So this is, uh, this is, the, this is the guy who's known as the Boston Strangler, Albert Albert DeSalvo. You can kind of read about him, but you see he was, a, he was in the Army. He worked in various employments. Um, he was described as I mean, he's a loving husband, devout father, mild-mannered, uh, well-liked. He is married, had two kids. Um, so, you know, he's definitely somebody you would never, never, who you typically wouldn't peg as being a serial killer. So here's his second personality. Um, he's also known as the Measurer or the Green Man. Somebody will be doing a presentation on him, so you'll kind of learn more about that. Um, so, yeah. All right, so there's two types of crime scenes. I'll kind of go through this. You can fill this in your guided notes. So this is a profile of somebody who's, you know, whether somebody's an organized offender or dis disorganized. Again, most serial killers fall into this category or, or organized. 75% 70, of serial killers fall into this category here. They're highly intelligent. They're steady employment. They kind of blend in society. 
They're socially adequate. They could even seem as being charming. Um, they're a good citizen. Um, they live with a partner, might be married, as you guys saw in the last example there, maybe have kids and be married. They might be a uh, came from a high birth status, medium class to higher class. Um, father had stable work, had a decent childhood growing up, um, is mobile, um, follows the crime of the media, again, highly intelligent, usually carries weapons around them, as you'll learn about Ted Bundy, that's how he was caught. They caught a, he carried his, his weapon uh, with him that he used to kill. Um, whereas you also have others that are disorganized, and this is like on a lower percentage of the population, but these are usually people that are be below average intelligence, these are socially inadequate people, socially awkward, uh, they're sexually incompetent, uh, they work at unskilled labor, low, no, poor, low birth status, um, really the opposite of what I just talked about for an organized defender. So it's important to understand in terms of, in terms of criminal profile in terms of who you're looking for. So here's an example of an organized killer, Ted Bundy. He plans out his murder. Uh, he wants to carry it out quickly. He'll bring a rape kit with him, rope, handcuffs, chloroform with him if desired. Um, he'll personalize him or herself with the victim. They'll use talks, leads, captures the victim in the planned murder situation. So that very well planned out, again, very charming, trying to trick his victim. He'll have personalization with her, talking with her, um, building conversation with her, gaining trust. Uh, and then, boom, there comes the event. Uh, again, for his own pleasure, his own gratification. This is something that's, you know, his own fantasy, so to speak. Uh, with serial killers, you'll notice a lot of them have fantasies of these sex uh, torture events. And they will carry out those things. Um, kill victims with awareness of evidence at crime scene, maybe clean, destroyed. Um, so again, this person, you'll see that the crime scenes are usually wiped down. Bodies moved um, or... Um, it's mo usually moved out of the site um, to rent from being caught. Um, may take a trophy, uh, clothing, jewelry um, to take, to, uh, you know, afterwards to remember that person to gain as a trophy from, from them. Disorganized killers, David Berkowitz. Uh, and these are people who typically spur the moment. They don't not really planned out or thought about. Um, does not bring tools to kill. Um, uh, no contact with the victim prior, it's usually spur the most. So these people are really hard to find because there's really no, not really a whole lot of connection. It's very random. Um, no rape or torture will take place after the murder. They murder and they are gone. Uh, usually bodies are left behind. So here's also kind of comparison between the crime scenes, between uh, organized and disorganized crime scene. Um, and organized, obviously, it's planned, as we talked about. Um, victims are targeted. There's personalization, as you guys saw with Ted Bundy. He's charmed. He charmed these, these women, talks to them, personalizes them. Uh, they will control the conversations, control the crime scene. Um, they usually wipe down the crime scene, so it's very a little hard to find evidence. Um, restraints are used, like handcuffs or uh, put them on a wire of some sort to restrain the victim. And very aggressive acts are usually... Uh, found in these kind of cases, and the body is moved. Again, if you're if you're planning it out, you're planning every aspect um, of it. So your body, you're moving the the body from the place that the murder took place. Uh, weapons are taken. There's very little evidence found. Uh, whereas a disorganized killer is somebody that's very spontaneous. It's not planned. The victims aren't known, so there's not really a whole lot of connections uh, to them. So these are very hard to find. But these people are also very sloppy in terms of their aftermath. Um, there's usually bodies not move, weapons are left, there's usually physical evidence that's left behind. Um, but again, it's a very chaotic crime scene, typically, in these types of things where a lot of rage um, and that kind of thing are, are, is found in, in these uh, scenes. So again, here's an you know, example of a stable killer, um, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, lives at work, lives and works in one location and for an extended period, hunts and kills within the local area, disposes of bodies in the same or similar manners, with sites selected for concealment, so they plan these things out. Um, may return to crime scene or burial site later on. Um, seldom travels, but when forced, will travel for work, family, or recreation. So they're very kind of stable killers, and losing one area. Then you have mobile killers who murder in a variety of different places. They call it the transient killer. 